Good morning. Welcome to Fusion Church, where we worship together both here in the sanctuary and from near and far over Zoom, but wherever we are, we are together as the one body of Christ. I invite you to join me in the call to worship in your bulletin. We come to give thanks to our God who brings help to the falling, who brings freedom to the captive, whose love sustains the living. Let us join together in worship. In our service, I have a few announcements I would like to share with you. Some of this, this is going to be a little bit long because I'm going to give you the entire calendar for the summer. Um, this is my last day before I leave on vacation tomorrow. Uh, it's actually, like after coffee hour. <laughs> Um, so we have a, a really great slate of summer preachers to fill our pulpit. Uh, next week is going to be Rick Stevens. We're very fortunate to have a lot of lay preachers in our own congregations. Next week is going to be Rick Stevens. The week after that, which I believe is July 25th, is going to be a prayer breakfast. That's our standard prayer breakfast, except for this year. We're not going to do a dish to pass. We're asking everybody to just bring their own breakfast so that people don't have to worry about um, COVID and things like that. So that will be over at the church center. Weather permitting, it will be outside, um, but the elders will be leading that prayer breakfast as they always do. And then the first week in August will be either John Buckwalter or a guest preacher, that's still to be decided. Um, and then the second week in August, August 8th, I think it is, is going to be Sarah Jacoby Murphy, who preached last year while I was gone. She Zoomed in, is she in Hammondsport? Is that where yeah. she is? Uh, she Zoomed in from Hammondsport. Great reviews um, she got from the congregation, so we've asked her to come again, and this time she will be here in the sanctuary live. Um, all of those services will be Zoomed as usual, but they will not be recorded because I'm the one who puts them up on the web, 
these are some of the things that we need to figure out before I retire, uh, but I haven't had a chance to, to change over all of the, you know, the privacy things and everything so that somebody else can do that. So if you want to participate or um, view any of those services, you'll have to do it live. You'll have to get up 10.30 in the morning on Sunday to actually see it, but they will be Zoomed. Um, some of the bulletins will come to you and remind as normally they do, uh, but I'm not sure we did all of those before I left. I can schedule those out, but I'm not sure we had all of those quite ready yet. So some of those bulletins you may get. Um, otherwise, they will be on the web, and Lana Meisner will send that out in the email, right, You're this week at UUC. Uh, so I think we're doing as, as best we can in terms of the Zooming while I'm gone. Um, while I'm gone also, Sharon Burdick is the chair of the diaconate, so if there are any pastoral concerns, please contact Sharon Burdick. She has my cell phone number and is um, authorized to use it in extreme cases. Uh, so you can talk to Sharon for any other needs. And the elder of the, um, the elder, chairperson of the elders is Deb Stevens, and so if you have any worship concerns, you can contact her. Then when I come back, just to put on your calendar so that you're ready for this and thinking about it, we'll have three memorial services right in a row. Um, two of these were because of people who died during the pandemic, so we had to postpone their memorial services. So if you could put on your calendar, August 21st is going to be the memorial service for Roger Smith. August 28th is the memorial service for Bill Crandall. And September 4th is the memorial service for Woody Lang. Those are all Saturdays, and I will, of course, tell you more about those, and they will be in the newsletters we come back, but please save those dates, August 21st, August 28th, and, and September 4th, for Roger Smith, Bill Crandall, and Woody Lang. Um, I think those are all the announcements that I have. We are having coffee hour following worship. Uh, beverages will be available for those who want to stay, and we can also uh, let those who are Zooming stay for coffee on, on Zoom as well. Are there any other announcements? Lana. Uh, I did bring uh, some printed directories. So if you are unable to print your directory that I sent out uh, this week, uh, there are copies here, two copies here, and I'll put them in the back, and feel free to take a print copy. So the new directories are out with updated information, and they are available either in the office, for those in the sanctuary, Lana has a few here. They're also available online. She put the link up in the um, email that you should have gotten it. I don't know if it's in the newsletter. No, it wouldn't have been because we did it after the newsletter. But uh, So it is available on the line, online. There's also online on our webpage, there's a place you can download it, but it is password protected, so you need to call the office to get the password. So, um, But those are available. Are there other announcements? Sorry, Sharon, I didn't even see that you were here. I have my reading glasses on, so uh, Sharon, we welcome you here to worship with us. It's nice to have you in the sanctuary. Are there other announcements? Is there anything on Zoom? Just raise your hand on Zoom if you have an announcement. I'm going to pause the recording. I invite you then to join me in prayer. God of eternal grace, we come here this morning, each with our own thoughts and needs from weeks that are very different from one another's. And yet we all come because we are joined by the recognition that we can find the strength and the help that we need in you. Send your spirit to us and clear in our hearts and minds a place for that spirit to reside. For those among us who are frightened and worried about the future, we ask that you send a spirit of calm a spirit of confidence that every day that comes will be lived out with you at our side. For those who are facing difficult decisions, send your spirit of wisdom so that the right path may become clear. For those who are traveling or preparing to travel, spend family time or have new adventures, we ask that you spend your spirit of joy to lighten and renew their hearts. And for those who are in grief and pain, send your spirit of comfort and healing that they may be able to bear the burden which is upon them now. We ask also, God, that you be with those who are not a part of this congregation or community, yet whose anguish we feel and care for, for the families of those lost in the condominium collapse, for the people of Haiti, 
for those battling injustice and the oppressed, for those in prison, those alone, the impoverished, and those whose lives are torn by war. May we be with them not only in prayer, but when we can and where we can, may we be with them in service and giving, that our call to share our resources with others may ease their burden. We thank you, God, for your constancy in our lives and the love that you have bestowed on us, which has shaped our lives so indelibly, which has blessed our days, and which gives us confidence for tomorrow. May we live lives worthy of that love, and may your Son's grace shine through all we do. Let us take a moment to bring our own personal concerns and hopes to God in silent prayer. Let us pray silently. God, hear these prayers and hear us as we lift our voices together to say the prayer that Jesus taught us to say. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Today's special music is an arrangement of the hymn, Be Thou My Vision.
Will you join me in the responsive reading from 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 2? Trust us, we've never hurt a soul, never exploited or taken advantage of anyone. I told you earlier that I'm with you all the way, no matter what. I have, in fact, the greatest confidence in you. If only you knew how proud I am of you. I know I distressed you greatly with my letter. Although I felt awful about it at the time, I don't feel at all bad now, now that I see how it turned out. The letter upset you, but only for a while. Now I'm glad. Not that you were upset. You let the distress bring you to God, not drive you from him. Distress that drives us to God does that. It turns us around. It gets us back in the way of salvation. But those who let distress drive them away from God are full of regrets. And now, isn't it wonderful all the ways in which this distress has goaded you closer to God? You're more alive, more concerned, more sensitive, more reverent, more human, more passionate, more responsible. God of grace, we hear your call to generous giving in the way you meet our needs each day and in the peace you give us, which passes all understanding. Having received so much in this quiet time of commitment, help us to consider how we might offer our time, talents, and money for the work of your kingdom.
Loving God, we come to you this morning to be reminded that you are the giver of life and hope, that in, in you we are refreshed and renewed. Bless our offering and guide us in using it to bring refreshment and renewal to all those in need. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
scripture for this morning is Paul's letter to Philemon, and I'm going to read the whole letter. It's not a really long letter, so this is Paul's letter to Philemon. He begins, I, Paul, am a prisoner for the sake of Christ. We think he was in prison when he wrote this letter. I, Paul, am a prisoner for the sake of Christ, here with my brother Timothy. I write this letter to you, Philemon, my good friend and companion in this work, also to our sister Aphia, to Archippus, a real trooper, and to the church that meets in your house. God's best to you and Christ's blessings on you. Every time your name comes up in my prayers, I say, oh, thank you, God. I keep hearing of the love and the faith you have for the Master Jesus, which brims over to other Christians. And I keep praying that this faith we hold in common keeps showing up in the good things we do and that people recognize Christ in all of it. Friends, you have no idea how good your love makes me feel, doubly so when I see your hospitality to fellow believers. In line with all of this, I have a favor to ask of you. As Christ's ambassador and now a prisoner for him, I wouldn't hesitate to command this if I thought it necessary, but I'd rather make it a personal request. While here in jail, I've fathered a child, so to speak, Here he is, hand-carrying this letter, Onesimus. He was useless to you before. Now he is useful to both of us. So I'm sending him back to you. But it feels like I'm cutting off my right arm in doing so. I wanted, in the worst way, to keep him here, here as your stand-in to help out while I'm in jail for the message. But I didn't want to do anything behind your back, make you do a good deed that you hadn't willingly agreed to. Maybe it's all for the best that you lost him for a while. You're getting him back now for good, and no mere slave this time, but a true Christian brother. That's what he was to me, and he'll be even more than that to you. So if you still consider me a comrade in arms, welcome him back as you would me. If he damaged anything or owes you anything, chalk it up to my account. This is my personal signature, Paul, and I stand behind him. I don't need to remind you, do I, that you owe your very life to me. Do this, this big favor, friend. You'll be doing it for Christ, but it will also do my heart good. I know you well enough to know that you will. You'll probably go far beyond what I've written. And by the way, get a room ready for me because of your prayers. I fully expect to be your guest again. Epiphus, my cellmate in the cause of Christ, says hello. Also my co-workers, Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, and Luke. All the best to you from the Master, Jesus Christ. The Bible says that as Christians, we are called to spread the gospel. While conservative Christians believe that that means winning souls to Christ, as progressive Christians, we accept the legitimacy of other religions And we believe that Christianity is not the only pathway to God. So what does it mean for us as progressive Christians to spread the gospel? Well, I believe that it means that we are called to create a society grounded in justice, that we are called to convince others to follow paths of forgiveness, mercy, and compassion, and that we are called to urge people toward reconciliation and peace. In other words, I believe that we are called not to change people's religious creeds, but to change people's hearts and minds and move them toward the kind of love for others that we have learned in Christ. And that's not an easy task. It's hard enough to practice love ourselves, let alone convincing others to show grace. So if we're to be successful in that calling, it's essential that we learn what I am going to term the art of persuasion. You can't convince someone to be more loving by hammering them over the head with hate. And you can't convince someone to be more accepting of our differences by yelling in their faces and calling them stupid for what they believe. You can't bring peace by going to war with your adversary to move the world toward greater compassion for one another, you have to use compassion to accomplish that goal, which means that you have to learn the art of persuasion so that they themselves will want to make the change toward love. So what is the art of persuasion? 
Do you remember some years back when Robert Fulgham wrote a popular book called Everything I Need to Know I Learned in Kindergarten? Well, my sermon today is titled, Everything I Need to Know About the Art of Persuasion, I Learned from My Dogs. As most of you know, I have two dogs, Dexter and Cody, who are in many ways the yin and the yang of dogdom. Dexter loves people. Cody has social anxiety. Dexter is easygoing, little phases him. Cody obsesses over the smallest problems. He will lick his feet raw with worry. Dexter lives to please me. Cody does not require my good opinion to be happy. The other day, for example, I needed to mow my back lawn. Finally got a break in the rain, and my back lawn is fenced in to keep my dogs from wandering out of the yard into the road, so in order to mow, I have to open the gate to bring the mower in. Dexter was in the backyard watching me intently, so before I opened the back gate, I said to him, stay, stay. <laughs> stay. He plopped his rear end on the ground and he waited obediently. I opened the gate, I went to the shed for the lawnmower. When I was in the shed, I noticed that I hadn't properly hung my gardening tools from earlier in the day, so I spent several minutes tidying up the interior of the shed, and finally, having gotten everything back into proper order, I grabbed that lawnmower and headed back to the yard, having by that time completely forgotten about Dexter. He, however, had not forget, forgotten me or my instructions because he had not moved an inch. I told him to stay, and he was going to stay. Now, if that had been Cody in the backyard, I would have handled things quite differently. Cody is also a very obedient dog, as long as I have my eyes locked on him. But if I had opened the gate and left Cody unattended while I poked about in the shed, he would have been out of the yard, down the driveway, and off on his own adventure seconds after I took my eyes off of him. Cody's favorite place to be is a place he knows he's not supposed to be. And the more I yell at him for leaving the yard, the more enticing leaving the yard becomes for him. What is it out there that you don't want me to see, he wonders. And driven by an insatiable curiosity about the world, he takes every chance he can to escape my oversight. Moreover, when I see that he has escaped, I've learned that no amount of calling, no threats, no yelling, no stern entreaties will get Cody to return to me if he's enjoying his expedition. The only thing that works is to play on Cody's FOMO, his fear of missing out. So I catch his attention, I stretch out my hand, I often put it in the pocket pretending I'm getting something, and I say, look, Cody, look at what I have. And if I make it sound intriguing enough, he will wander back to investigate my hand where I can take him then by the collar and bring him back to the house. I usually do give him a treat afterwards to reward him for investigating. That's the art of persuasion. Just as it is with my dogs, so too we have to learn what motivates a person because everybody has different motivations. And we have to make them decide that changing is something that they want to do. Everyone is different. Everyone is motivated by different things. Everyone has different fears. Everyone has different priorities. So to persuade someone to change, to become more just or compassionate or merciful, you have to listen to that person as much as you talk to them. Because you want to address not only what you want them to do, but what fears and concerns they have that are keeping them from doing it. You have to find ways of making people personally invested in the outcome that you desire so that pursuing justice and peace is not something that just makes sense. It's something that makes sense for them. Reverend Jean Bartlett, who was president of Colgate Rochester Divinity School during the tumultuous decade of the 1960s, said, the number of times when life is changed because we were convinced something was a good idea is comparatively small. But the number of times when it changed because the pain of not changing 
became unbearable is comparatively large. The art of persuasion is the art of learning how to listen so that we know how to convince people that the pain of injustice is more unbearable than the pain of justice. That the pain of holding on to old wounds is more unbearable than the pain of forgiveness. And that the pain of intolerance towards others is more unbearable than the pain of learning to accept human diversity. And that the pain of remaining entrenched in fear and hatred is more unbearable than the pain of practicing compassion. We have to find ways of making people invested in the outcome that we desire so that pursuing justice and peace is not just something that makes sense. It's something that makes sense for them. And that's exactly what Paul does in this scripture I read for today. Philemon is often a neglected book in our Bible because it's so short and it's just a personal letter. But it's a really important one. Because Paul's letter to the Philemon is a model for the art of persuasion. So let's look at it again. Paul is writing to Philemon because Philemon is the owner of a slave named Onesimus, who's now living in the town where Paul is imprisoned. And most scholars assume from the tone of Paul's letter that Onesimus is a runaway slave, which would mean that Onesimus is facing a very uncertain future. Slavery in ancient Rome was, as it is in every age, a brutal, violent, dehumanizing institution, and slaves were seen as akin to property or animals. Romans were especially obsessed with runaway slaves. It was easier to run away back then because slaves were the same color. So it was easier to hide. And so they became, Roman owners became very obsessed with those runaway slaves and there were professional slave catchers that owners could hire to hunt down the escapees. And then when that runaway slave was found, their punishment was severe and their owner might even make them wear an iron collar like a dog engraved with instructions on what would happen if they escaped again. You can still see those collars in some museums. We wish that Paul, in his letter, would have just denounced the laws that gave Philemon the right to enslave Onesimus, but Paul realizes a righteous rant against Philemon is not going to save this runaway. Philemon is a wealthy Roman, and he has a reputation to maintain among his associates. So showing mercy toward a runaway slave is not going to sit well with Philemon's friends. So Paul practices the art of persuasion by reminding Philemon of other things that he has at stake in this issue. I write this letter to you, Philemon, my good friend and companion in this work, Paul begins, and then he adds, every time your name comes up in my prayers, I say, oh, thank you, God, because I keep hearing of the love and the faith that you have for the Master Jesus, which brims over to other Christians. That's not simple flattery that Paul is employing here. He's reminding Philemon that his reputation among his Roman associates is not the only reputation in jeopardy. Paul knows that Philemon also values his standing in the church, where he is apparently known to be a great example of discipleship and a beloved partner of the apostle. So while punishing a runaway slave may elevate Philemon in the eyes of his wealthy associates, it's going to lower him in the estimate of Paul and his church. Paul makes Philemon recognize that any injustice toward Onesimus is going to have painful results for Philemon as well. Paul then continues by couching his request as a favor between friends. I wouldn't hesitate to command this if I thought it was necessary, but I'd rather make it a personal request, Paul says. Again, acknowledging he wants Philemon to be personally invested in this choice. He's hoping not just for acquiescence from Philemon, but for a complete change of heart. And finally, Paul says, I'm appealing to you for my child, Onesimus, 
whose father I have become during my imprisonment. I am sending him that is my own heart back to you. If you consider me your partner, welcome him as you would welcome me. With these words, Paul changes the nature of Onesimus and Philemon's relationship. And he invites Philemon to see Onesimus not as property, but as someone who has the potential to be like a son to him as he is to Paul, working alongside Philemon in the work that they are doing together for Christ. You might lose a slave, Paul is telling Philemon, but you will gain a son. He has shown how Philemon, he has shown Philemon how welcoming Onesimus back with forgiveness and grace will not only be good for Onesimus, it will also be good for Philemon. Paul's letter to Philemon is a model in the art of persuasion, even to the very last sentence. I love this closing. Look at it again. As he closes the letter, Paul says to Philemon, I know you well enough to know you will do this. And in fact, I expect you'll probably go far beyond what I have written. Paul is saying to Philemon, you know, your grace exceeds my own. He provides Philemon with a huge investment in changing his heart towards his runaway slave because Philemon has the chance to prove that he is not only the man Paul believes him to be, but he is a man who will go all beyond everything else. He will do anything it takes to satisfy Christ. How could Philemon not be changed by that letter? We are called by Christ to create a society grounded in justice, to convince others to follow paths of forgiveness, mercy, and compassion, and to urge people toward reconciliation and peace. And we will not accomplish that by hammering them over the head with angry words, by yelling in their faces, calling them stupid for what they believe, or even by ordering them to change. To move the world toward greater compassion for one another, we have to learn the art of persuasion. We have to make sure that pursuing justice and peace is not just something that makes sense, but it is something that makes sense for them. May Paul's letter to Philemon be our model as we work to learn the art of persuasion, and we do it in the name of Christ. Let us bow our heads in prayer. God, our calling to change the world is not only a meaningful one, but a very difficult one, because it will require us to be open to others, to listen to their concerns and their fears, and to be willing to work with them, to persuade them that justice and peace and compassion makes sense not only for the world, but also for them. Help us, God, to practice the art of persuasion. In your son's name we pray. Amen.
And now deep peace of the quiet earth to you, deep peace of the singing brook to you, deep peace of gentle hearts to you, deep peace of the light of the world to you. Go in peace, now and forever. Amen. Those on Zoom are invited to stay for coffee hour. Those in the sanctuary are invited to go to the church center for coffee hour. And for everybody else, have a good week. Have a good month. <laughs>